Good evening. Good morning. 大家好。Yeah, I just want to give a few seconds for all the guests to enter the Zoom, and we will start the program shortly. All right. Again, good evening. Good morning. 大家好。Welcome to join today's program, discussing the future of U.S.-China educational exchange. My name is Shen Zhan Liao, head of the School of Chinese Studies at China Institute. I will be moderating today's program. But first, please allow me to turn to Mr. James Hamowitz, President of China Institute, for welcome remarks. Thank you so much, Shenzhan. It's really a delight and a pleasure to be with you all this evening.、Um, I feel so honored and proud to be able to welcome you and to welcome our friends at、uh, Huadong Shifan Da Xue in Shanghai to what promises to be a really interesting program this evening.、Um, you know, for those of you who、um, are in the space between China and the U.S., you'll know what a really difficult time this has been over the past few years. Um, but I would say it's nothing really unsurmountable, nothing difficult for China Institute. For those of you who don't know us, we were founded in 1926 by a famous educator called Hu Shi, and、um, there were many obstacles in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the 1940s. I don't want to say every decade up until 2020, but we've come a tremendous way.、Um, now universities in China have the academic stature and the ability. To help the world understand the many things that are going on inside academia in China, and we're so grateful to be able to showcase some of the many things that our partners at ECNU are doing. And we're going to be opening. Actually, we should have opened, but due to this nasty COVID virus, we've been forced to put off a little bit.、Um, but we will be opening、um, and celebrating a brand new ECNU center at China Institute. When we open up, we encourage you to come and visit. I was there yesterday. It's a beautiful new space, and it truly is worthy of all of the exciting and innovative things that are happening in academia, and particularly at ECNU at China. And while China Institute does many things, we have an art gallery that brings、uh, guo, guo ba,、uh, treasures from China、um, to the U.S. for Americans to understand better. We work with school kids so that they can. Incorporate into their curriculum a more nuanced and authentic understanding of China through art, through culture, and education.、Um, but I think at the core is really connecting with people like you on the call, on this Zoom call, and truly trying to bring an authentic voice and a deeper, more nuanced understanding of actually what's happening. And、um, I would like to say, for those of us, you know,、um, for my colleague Shenzhan, and for those of you that are on the call with me, you know, we get a lot of criticism. But I want to be here to be to tell you, as the president of China Institute, that we stand up unabashedly and proudly to say we believe in engagement, we believe in collaboration, and we believe in the common pursuit of academic interests, and believe that the world is a better place because we have these kinds of academic exchanges and conferences to、um, to host and to be a part of. So you didn't come to listen to me. We've got a very exciting program ahead of us. So I will hand it back to my colleague Shenzhan to kickstart us off for the evening. Thank you all. Thank you, James. Like James mentioned, we have an amazing group of professors today,、uh, with two main speakers whose remarks will be followed by a roundtable discussion, joined by a panel of professors from the Faculty of Education at East China Normal University, Huadong Shi Fan Da Xue. Um, now the professors from ECNU are all in the conference room in Shanghai.、Uh, we are also looking forward to open the Q and A to our audience.、Uh, we have over 100 people tuned in today, signed up、uh, from both the United States and China. Thank you very much for joining the public discussion on this very important topic. Please do use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions or share your comments at any time during the program. Please state your name and organization you are from, and of course, if you choose so, you can stay anonymous. So now I have the honor to introduce Professor Xun Yuan, Professor Xun, and、um, my ECNU colleagues. Can you please turn on the camera? 
they have two cameras. One is focusing on the speaker. Now will be Professor Xun. And the other one is showing the conference room. So can we turn on the camera so that we can see you from Shanghai? Yep. Okay. Professor Xun is the executive deputy dean of the Faculty of Education at ECNU, an expert himself on higher education and teacher education. Professor Xun is stepping in for Professor Yan Zhengguo today. As China Institute, like James mentioned, is looking forward to building the ECNU Center at China Institute in the future, we are excited to have you and your colleagues to join today's program. So Professor Xun, I will start with uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, I know you will be responding in uh, Chinese. I will be translating as well, um, but I will start for the audience uh, the questions in English. Since its establishment in 2014, the Faculty of Education, integrating all institutional branches of educational research and training at ECNU, has a mission to develop educational research in China, enhance education quality, and share Chinese experience with the world. Participating in global dialogues has been the major commitment. Does the current pandemic situation affect the com commitment? How do you envision the Faculty of Education continues to join and contribute to global dialogues, given the world seems to have changed significantly during the pandemic and afterwards. So now I will turn to Professor Xin. Okay, uh, 我就用中文讲了,因为我知道James的中文非常好,也想看伸展能不能帮我做一些同事做一下翻译。首先非常高兴能够在这样的一个网络的空间和大家见面。所以生产还有詹姆斯还有詹姆斯你们是晚上那么晚上好我们华东师大的教育学部应该说非常的荣幸能够和华美学进会一起来合作来去开展我们两国之间的这种高等教育的或者教育的一些问题的一些研究和
呃，我们在几个方面做了一些事情。呃，第一个方面呢，是因为呃疫情期间呢，很多学生都回到了家庭，那么我们就很快呢组织了教育学部的教授，甚至还邀请了美国的堪萨斯大学教育学院的教授们，今年三月份呢一起做了一门课程，叫《抗疫中的教育学》，呃，都是微课程。我们连续三十四天发布共一百个这种微视频的课程，那么总长呢达五百分钟。那这些东西呢都是围绕着一些教育的一些经典的问题或者一些比较热点的问题，引发学生去学习、讨论、呃阅读。呃，应该说呢，从国际上还是国内，呃，得到了很高的认同和支持。Yeah, so one, um, one. Program that what we did with the School of Education from University of Kansas, for example, is this March since the beginning of the pandemic, because many of our students went back home.、Uh, we gathered the professors and in collaboration with University of Kansas、um, to start a program called the、um, Educational Pedagogy during the pandemic. For a consecutive of 34 days or 34 sessions,、uh, including a video of altogether over 500、um, minutes, and all of the content is closely related to the classic and also the timely topics、uh, that's during the pandemic for the students and the、um, educators, for students to study, to discuss, to read. And has been widely recognized and、um, and got positive feedbacks from、um, all different、uh, for different parties. Okay, 呃，我们的 ECU Review of Education 就是我们的华东师大的教育评论英文刊呢，呃，在疫情期间呢，组织了呃一系列的文章，呃，专门讨论这种疫情后的或者是疫情期间的呃国际高等教育的发展，啊，就是这本。这本这本刊物，那么呃，待会我们的陈主任教授也会专门就这个问题和我们的美国的教授做交流和探讨。嗯哼，呃 ，In another aspect,、um, the Faculty of Education also has been、um, publishing and also improving the dialogue through its ECNU Review of Education. It's a journal that, through the Faculty of Education, that's building. This platform to have an in-depth dialogue、uh, with the world on educational topics,、um, especially during and、uh, and the, the after the pandemic period,、uh, related to higher education and many other educational topics.、Uh, this review of education has becoming a、um, a platform to、uh, contribute to the to the dialogue. Professor Shang Yechen from、um, ECNU later, as one of our main speakers,、uh, will speak more about the journal. 嗯、呃，还有一件事情呢，我们今年非常遗憾，呃，我们在二零一八年、一九年连续两年举办了全球教育学院院长的论坛，但是今年因为疫情的关系呢，我们没有法没有办法在现场举办。但是呢，我们在十一月二十二日。我们和美国波士顿学院一起，在线上组织了一个明年的全球教育学院院长论坛的预备会议，那么特别探讨了，呃，在全球疫情下，不同国家和地区的目前教育遇到的挑战、问题和应对的举措。嗯、uh...。One regret this year, because of the pandemic,、um, uh, the global educational、uh, forum、uh, for school of educations from all over the world. We have been、um, initiating and having that forum for two years, but this year we were not able to、uh, have the forum. Uh, however, on November twenty second, with Boston College,、uh, we've had an online. Preparation conference regarding the forum for next year,、uh, especially focusing、uh, on the、um, during the pandemic, what's the challenges and opportunities for the、uh, that education are facing right now. Okay, 
呃，还有一件非常值得我们去铭记的事情，就是在今年三月份的时候呢，呃，中国的疫情呢非常严重，那么世界学前教育组织中国委员会收到了一份来自意大利，呃，这个世界学前组织的主席深切的慰问和祝愿。那但是不久之后呢，意大利也进入了一个危急的状况，所以在三月十六号。意大利的呃，这个学前教育主席呢，向中国委员会呢申请儿童游戏活动在线教育资源方面的援助。我们教育学部的多位教授，呃，因为在这个世界教育学前教育这个组织呢为任职，所以呢，他们很快就召开这个线上会议，召集各个小组，组织了一批这种学前教育资源，并且很快把它翻成英文，编辑成册，交给了意大利的这个。呃，世界学习上组织的主席。嗯哼 ，One thing I want to mention and also very memorable is during March when the pandemic was、uh, severe in China,、uh, OMEP,、uh, the World Organization for Early Childhood Education, the Chinese, the the committee in China received the、um, the greetings and also the、uh, the, the 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 care from. The, the president from Italy,、uh, Mr. Cobucci.、Um, however, not long after,、uh, Italy also was in a very、um, severe situation,、uh, in a crisis.、Um, on March 16th,、um, President Cobucci、um, asked from the Chinese Committee、um, regarding the、uh, the games、uh, resources on the games of children's. Activities online,、um, and the Faculty of Education.、Uh, many professors, while from the Faculty of Education, actually、um, have positions at the Chinese Committee of the OMEP.、Uh, we gathered the resources and also、uh, collect the、uh, online resources、um, and translate them into English、um, and deliver them to、uh, to Italy. Uh, as part of the contribution to this international exchange. 在目前全球疫情快速蔓延和不确定因素持续增加的形势下，呃，我相信呢，呃，无论是呃中美还是其他的欧洲一些国家，我们应该呃一起携手，呃，在应对疫情的这种挑战的同时，共同来研究在疫情的情况下，特别是在后疫情以后，我们的教育。呃，将来应该怎么去发展？我们怎么去建立更广泛、更深度的这种国际合作的交流，使全球的教育，呃，世界各国的教育能够形成我们在应对一些重大挑战问题上的一些共识。那么也特别感谢，呃呃，各位能够参加这次讨论，尤其要感谢伸展，呃，要给我还要做翻译这样一个辛苦的工作。Um, so for the current situation that the pandemic is still spreading and with a lot of uncertainties in the world,、uh, for the faculty of education and all the professors and my colleagues、uh, at BCNU,、uh, we are looking forward well to face the challenges and also have discussions and doing research so that well we can、uh, together explore the future direction of education and educational exchange. And to develop and deepen our understandings、uh, among each other and with each other in the educational field,、uh, to form a shared view for the future. And thanks for organizing this discussion. And、um, I'm happy to do the translation.、Uh, thank you, Professor Shin. I know you are very busy. You probably、uh, will have、um, have to leave for another meeting. But thanks for your opening remarks. 好，谢谢。Thank you. Okay. So and also, I hope、uh, this discussion, as Professor Shin mentioned,、uh, we are facing、uh, the challenges and the future together. And discussions like this, we hope that what、well, we can together explore the future direction of education in the world.、Um, so now. I want to,、um, with the pleasure, 
introduce our two main speakers today. I know there's a music chair uh, in the ECNU <laughs> conference room that we are, uh, we are looking at right now. So now you can see Professor Shang Ye Chen from um, Institute of Curriculum and Education at East China Normal University and a founding executive director of the ECNU Review of Education, which as Professor Xun mentioned in his remarks, it's the first open access international journal on education in China. I remember my meeting with Professor Chen in New York in 2018, over two years ago, when the journal was launched at China Institute. It's great to meet again in this virtual world, and I do look forward to seeing you and your colleagues in person soon in the future. So before Professor Chen goes into her remarks, I also want to introduce the, uh, the other uh, uh, main speaker, Professor Dennis Simon. Dennis, can you please turn on your camera just for a second? You, you, ha uh, you have it uh, closed. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> From your so, side. Oh, uh, so I have to call Aaron. Okay, here yes, I am. Now, here. Okay. So, apologies. Uh, Professor Simon is a senior advisor to the President for China Affairs at Duke University and a professor of China Business and Technology in the Fuqua School at Duke. A true friend of China, Professor Simon is a thought leader in science, technology, and higher education in China, author of several books on corporate strategies and technology. He recently completed a five-year term as the executive vice chancellor of Duke Kunshan University, which we will hear more later. So now I will start with um, my first few questions with Professor Chen. Uh, many of us are wondering, we are facing a pandemic that's unfolding differently, very differently in the US and China with travel restrictions between the two countries and around the world a tightened US-China relation that affects multiple levels from policy making to individual decisions. My questions are, how are Chinese students and scholars react to the current situation? What are the trends in China now towards international education in the US? So now with that, I will turn the floor to Professor Chen. And I uh guess, Dennis and I will disappear for a second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Shenzhen. Thank you, uh, uh, China Institute. I'm very honored on behalf of our uh, Faculty of Education at East China Normal University and our journal, ACNU Review of Education, to share my observations and thoughts on this, the future of US-China educational exchange. Yeah, uh, before I start, uh, I think I can, uh, I can just have a very uh, brief uh, idea to share. That is a very major, and also I think this would uh, lead my thoughts through my talk. That is, I would like to uh, see the future from the current see the larger picture from the small trends. Yeah, so I have prepared some uh, uh, PowerPoints, but some, uh, made, uh, some small slides uh, there. Uh, the, for the first one is that um, my uh, statement, actually the next page of my PowerPoint, I show that is although uh, all kinds of confrontation are, are existing, and we can see the diplomatic commerce, uh, even this as cultural confrontation will prevail uh, in some way. But I still believe the collaboration is human. Before I move to the next page, I would like to share a story that is, uh, uh, you know, that is uh, after uh, eight days, it will be Christmas. Do you remember 108 years ago, what happened? Uh, at that Christmas uh, in the First World War. 
I think that story is glorious and legendary. It will remind me, and also I would like to share with you about our commitment and also our um, from the, our ordinary people's idea how much we could trust our humanity. So the next page is about this. Next page, yes, yeah, thank you. So you will see the picture from this, uh, the first world war that is a soldier's place soccer in the non man's land during the Christmas truce in 1914. Uh, the historian Tony Ashworth discovered this roof. The leaf and the leaf system existed at that Christmas truce. Although it's legendary, but we can still can see that how people, they would like uh, to share uh, with each other. And uh, now let's, um, you, will, you will see that is the, although given this kind of a hard situation, but currently in 2020, uh, we still enter into a different uh, world. That world is a virtual world. And what we can believe, we are not in the history uh, anymore. But now we have a new floor that is the Zoom, the virtual world. And you will know everything that we can do, it seems like uh, we can do it through Zoom. And behind those visible confrontations, there are frequent virtual meetings and exchanges than before. That is how we can meet you uh, over this discussion organized by China Institute. So that Zoom, it's also kind of for support my optimism on shared humanity from history and my experience. So in the next page, okay, please turn to the next page. Uh, that is, I wish also share you some uh, microdata. That is data would demonstrate kind of a micro trains that would demonstrate my uh, confidence and also my faith in the China-US educational exchange. From 1978, since the opening up of China till last year, we have already got the 6.5 million outbound students from China to the all over the world. And the majority of them um, moved to the United States. And from 1978 to uh, 2019, we will have uh, around more than 50, 85% uh, overseas students returned back to China. And currently we have a 1.6 million are staying abroad still for their uh, study and for life. And just that uh, a week ago, our education minister um, delivered a recent talk on a world MOOC um, conference that uh, he insisted on our ongoing support for studying abroad and encourage our Chinese students to study abroad. Uh, including to the United States. And also, we also observe this kind of micro trains in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and those big cities and metropolitan cities in China. That is from the local curriculum, even from our, our national curriculum, we still emphasize on this uh, international competence for all students. So this is a part of our national curriculum requirement. We will have our expert, Dr. Wang Tao, uh, will elaborate on that. He is an expert on it. And also I observed that that is a phenomenon uh, from China. That is, the, you know, we have a large uh, market for shadow education and English learning is still the most heavily invested field or subject in our education market. <laughs> Some of our <laughs> audience are laughing, yeah, because we are all the parents, uh, are, we are investing in our, our kids' English learning. That is not only by Chinese parents, but also by those gigantic uh, venture capitals and the big companies. So I think this is a how what I mentioned, that those micro trains will still um, support and boost my confidence in the future but I think maybe a longer future of US and China educational exchange. So I think although there is a something you will see fluctuated with the 
uh, change uh, would um, have some complication, uh, con confrontations, the uh, humanity, shared humanity, and this a desire to exchange, to meet with each other are still there. This, this is consistent. Um, however, I still have some warnings or some reservations for the future uh, US-China educational exchange, but I think will be some uh, thought, a thread of thoughts uh, to share with you. So in the next page, yeah, please turn to the next page. Oh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, the first one. Now I, I found uh, quite a lot of talks focusing on educational change um, are more about the money, the money talks. That is what people are concerned about. If, uh, if they cannot come, uh, we will lose students and we will lose incomes. So this is what consider more about money consequence of this educational change. If we still eye on this money consequence and what we'll miss from the larger picture, of our educational exchanges. So I think currently, if when we talk about educational exchange, we're talking about the moving students, student mobility, we can uh, leave aside from this money consequence a little bit, or at least a little bit far away from this money consequence to see more. So uh, next page, please. Next page, yeah. This is what I would like to share with you of my concern and also what uh, my research is about. That is, uh, let's consider about this knowledge consequence of educational exchange. This knowledge is not about the codified and the formal knowledge and the book to book introducing China, introducing US and um, help you got a job there and uh, in China, no. That's not about those kind of knowledge. It's about the testing knowledge. I think those testing knowledge about the different culture was there really their daily experience of people there, of country there. Those are kind of, I would say, it's kind of strategic tacit knowledge about the different systems, about the different countries. So I would like to share data in 2012 that is uh, by uh, research in China that is uh, 78 78% Chinese universities presidents, they are they got their overseas degrees, and the most of them are doctoral uh, degrees. What that mean? This doesn't mean that we are peripheral countries and the US or UK, they are central countries. So we, we have to move there to get a degrees. I think when they come back. The 78% of university president, when they come back, they brought back not only about this technology, but also about their understanding, their testing knowledge about the country. And this could be strategically used for winning the game or building a better understanding or educational exchanges among the different countries. So not to mention about university president, presidents, have you ever considered what I called that 80, 86% of the returnees return the Chinese overseas students? Now, where are they? Yeah, most, uh, most of them are in our elite class, in our well-educated positions. Even they were located, positioned, in our ministries, in our commerce, in our Chinese venture capitals. So they are in the, all those important sectors in China. They are the backbones in China now. So that's why I would like to urge people and us to think more about this educational exchanges, not only from the money consequence, but also from knowledge consequence. And, and last, just a uh, next PowerPoint, please. Yeah. Uh, this is my last goal. That is uh, about human consequence. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman, uh, the very infamous sociologist, he had published this kind of book on globalization, the human consequences. 
But it seems like people usually thought that now we are entering into an era of deglobalization. No, I don't think so. At least from my observations, uh, his thoughts and his insights are still there. That is, we are entering into a kind of a more polarized globalization. And this is a how we can do from our education and through our education and from uh, educational exchange we can do for the world. That is, uh, from Zygmunt Bauman said, the globalization make us divided, divided into two worlds. The first world, the people there are living time. The only scarcity is about time, so they can move around. Although now we cannot really move by transportations, but we can move or we can do this kind of exchange from the Zoom platform. So most international students or exchange students, they are in the first world. They live in time, although some of them pretty challenging for like uh, they were living in Princeton, uh, Princeton time, they were living in Boston time, but um, they still live in time. However, we still have a large proportion of people and students that live in the second world. Those are combined, the bounded by space. The time means nothing to them. What they can do just sitting before the television and kill their time. So I think when we talk about educational exchanges, we have to be quite cautious about the class the division, uh, the divided uh, world. And we can think more about this kind of education change, how much we can cultivate the future generation. They will know more than one culture and they will have a warm, ambitious mind. So the last point I think is our hope. Next page, next page please, next PPT, PowerPoint, yes. That is, um, we are the critical mass. And uh, when we are sitting here, we are discussing there, we have to be, um, we have to remind ourselves about re our, our responsibilities. So educational change is our joint venture and is the future. Uh, that's all for my share, uh, for my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Sinjan. Thank you. Let me just quickly turn on my uh, video. Thank you, Professor Chen. Um, I love how optimistic you are. And I, I especially, I love how you started with a moving story from over 100 years ago as we are approaching Christmas. And then the last point you made uh, was about humanities as well. And everything that we are talking about today uh, touches, upon, touches upon financial uh, aspects, but also there are so much more regarding knowledge, regarding technology, regarding shared understanding. Uh, so looking forward to more discussions and Professor Chen, you sort of like direct a certain direction for your colleagues to talk about uh, the curriculum, the national curriculum in China that has an international um, competence that's still built in. So I'm sure uh, I'm looking forward to hear more and uh, some of the audience will maybe interested in uh, and I look forward well to hear their comments and questions as well. So uh, as you mentioned the joint venture uh, in your last sentence, I now will turn to Professor Dennis Simon, uh, Duke Kunshan University. It's a partnership between Duke University and Wuhan University since 2013. Uh, it has built a vibrant camp campus with both graduate and undergraduate degree programs, a perfect example of building a world-class liberal arts university with joint efforts from two universities in the US and China, as well as the city of Kunshan, a fast growing city in the affinity of Shanghai and Suzhou, uh, so, Dennis, if you can turn on your camera or Aaron, can you help? I think it's you guys again. <laughs> Aaron, yep, can it's, you please? it's on your end. Yep, okay. All right, now here okay. we are. 
Yes. There we are. So, Professor Simon, as you successfully led the first five years of starting DKU, how do you see an exemplary case of international education and partnership like DKU be affected by the pandemic? Of course, pandemic, I know it's a rather um, small or focused topic. It's on everybody's mind, but well, it, it touches upon so many aspects as uh, our topic today, international exchange and partnership will be about. So, um, and stemming from that, will it be more challenging to start and continue a project like DKU? Um, and perhaps a larger question, I'm just, going to throw everything at you right now. <laughs> What's the outlook of US-China joint venture, quote unquote, in education in the future? So please, Dennis. Well, again, let me start by thanking the Chinese Institute for organizing this uh, forum. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to uh, uh, get to know one another and uh, build some bridges uh, because I think the most important thing right now uh, is to remember that the rela relationship really does depend on our ability to reconstruct uh, some of the bridges that have been uh, at least damaged over the last uh, two, two or three years. And uh, uh, we need to uh, continue to build more bridges into the future. Um, I was fortunate to be, actually, it's the second executive vice chancellor. Uh, Mary Bullock uh, uh, was the first uh, executive vice chancellor. And um, I built on uh, some of the work that she had started. Uh, and uh, my successor, Al Bloom, is uh, now, of course, building on uh, some of the work that uh, I uh, accomplished when I was the EBC. Um, this is uh, by no means an easy project. Um, it involves a uh, multiplicity of challenges. And of course, when something like COVID-19 comes along uh, and you are faced with you know, an, a challenge that you never really imagined was going to come, it really does test uh, the, uh, the, the solidness of the relationship and really whether or not the joint venture is in fact a, a really joint in terms of uh, can it hold together in times of crisis. Um, I want to recommend we uh, in the spring at Duke uh, held a uh, seminar uh, about the coronavirus and the impact on uh, Duke Quinshan and on Duke. Uh, and uh, uh, just this week, the book called The Coronavirus, uh, Human, Social and Political Implications was just published by Polgrave. And uh, I would because it has a lot of great essays uh, that talk about what it looked like from the ground up and from the top down uh, in terms of the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on this joint venture and how it affected uh, not only things in China, but also the bilateral uh, engagement between Duke uh, and uh, Wuhan and uh, the city of Quinshan. So um, let me talk a little bit about the challenges first about these joint venture universities, because I think some people don't appreciate all the things that have to be accomplished in order to make them work very well. Um, now first of all, there are a number of operational channels, uh, challenges that are out there. And these involve you know, simply selecting the right partner, um, uh, building this uh, joint venture in the right location, um, and making sure that you share a common focus and uh, a similar mission. You know, in Chinese, uh, there's this uh, notion of tung chuang imeng, you know, sleeping in the same bed, but with two different dreams. And, um, you know, in some of these joint ventures, uh, there are definitely aspects in which the partners uh, sort of agree to disagree. They move forward, but they don't always uh, share the same, same exact uh, goals. And uh, you can imagine that that uh, uh, in the case of Quinshan, for example, they were very, very interested in the economic and technological impact of uh, uh, DKU. Uh, Duke itself, very interested in promoting uh, liberal arts in the Chinese higher education system. And those two goals don't always mesh. Uh, uh, they do at times, but uh, there are also moments when they're uh, very, very difficult. Then there are the curricular uh, challenges that are out there. Um, as you noted, um, uh, building a liberal arts education in China, a Western liberal arts education in China, uh, is also a, a big challenge. Now, I, I think that we, we really must give kudos uh, to the Ministry of Education and to Chinese leaders for having the foresight 
to actually approve and allow these joint ventures. There are now nine of them and soon to be 10, uh, these joint ventures to actually exist in China. And they've allowed them uh, fairly unencumbered uh, to grow and prosper. And I think this is a great example of the effort at reforming the Chinese higher education system. And my sense is that the presence of these joint ventures uh, will continue to have a positive impact. But nonetheless, there are, there are big challenges. Our curriculum has to be accredited um, by the U on the US side by the Southern States accreditation because we give a Duke degree. And also we have to meet the requirements of the Chinese higher education system because we're going to give a degree from Duke Kunshan University. And uh, getting those two again to integrate well and mesh together well is not always an easy thing to accomplish. Third, there are the partnership challenges. And I don't only mean the, the Sino-US uh, partnership. I also mean the partnership between Duke Quinshan and Duke itself. Um, again, uh, the home campus has its concerns and its issues. Uh, sometimes not all the faculty are on board with the same sets of goals and objectives regarding the joint venture. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, the local uh, faculty may have different concerns as well. And so you have to get these to uh, be all worked out. Then there are the financial dimensions and the challenges associated. A lot of people think that the Duke and uh, NYU and other universities went to China for a big payday, but nothing could be uh, further from the truth. Um, the reality is that these things are very expensive to operate. There are very high costs to recruit a world-class faculty uh, to help uh, make sure that we can get students from all over the world. So the level of scholarship is also uh, uh, considerable. Uh, and then there's also the, the issue of the home campus. The cost of managing the enterprise from the US side um, is also not insignificant. And there's lots of travel uh, and lots of hosting that has to go on that all basically uh, you know, raise the cost of running one of these operations. And last but not least, uh, as you might expect, there are also the political uh, dimensions. Uh, little could we have imagined that uh, uh, the joint venture would find itself right smack in the middle of the uh, trade tensions between the US and China, and then the subsequent difficulties that have uh, emerged over the last uh, 24 to 36 months. Um, this put uh, lots of pressure on us in, in many, many different ways. And we've had to deal with this on a regular basis and we've always tried to keep close touch uh, with the embassy, with the consulate, with the uh, AmCham Shanghai, the U.S. Chamber in, in Beijing, just so we can have our hand on the pulse of where the relationship was and how it might affect our, our operations. Now, saying this, uh, one should not forget that there are also some very rewarding moments. And I think this is something that uh, we have to remember all along. So a lot of people ask, why did you know, Duke go out to uh, Quinchan and uh, engage in this joint venture? And uh, of course, this is part of Duke's effort to have a global footprint as, a, as an international university. And uh, of course, having a presence in the world's number two uh, economy with one of the largest and richest talent pools in the world is something that uh, Duke did not lose sight of when it made the decision to go out to uh, Quinchan. But uh, there are also some other things that are very rewarding. Uh, first, let me cite the opportunity for curricular innovation. One of the best things about uh, having a startup enterprise is that you start with a blank sheet of paper and uh, you can invent and uh, develop um, many, many new things uh, that you might not be able to do back on the home campus because you're not encumbered by legacy systems or lots of old baggage, et cetera, or vested interests. And therefore you can be a little bit more creative and push the edge in terms of curriculum. Second, there's the faculty development aspect. Uh, lots of Duke faculty have gone out to DKU and had exposure to China and Chinese culture. Uh, for many of them, it was a very uh, unique international experience that has had a long-term impact in terms of their career trajectory and their research programs. The third thing that is there is the knowledge transfer opportunity. Um, 
we get uh, about almost uh, a little over 2,000 visitors per year over the last uh, three or four years. Each of these visitors comes to DKU to try to understand what's going on. Either they're interested in the administrative structure or they're interested in the academic program, but they all want to study what's going on at DKU and pick and cherry pick in some cases, some of the best aspects of what we are doing there and bring them back to their own campuses, whether they're in China or other parts of Asia or even back into the United States. And then finally, uh, there is the whole question, as I mentioned before, the access to China's vast uh, talent pool. Uh, we are the beneficiary uh, when it comes time to recruiting uh, students, recruiting graduate students, and also even recruiting faculty uh, that we have access to some of the best young minds uh, in the world that uh, have great promise and we can uh, teach them in the classroom or bring them on board as faculty. And uh, uh, I think that that's something that uh, we have benefited from uh, for a long time. Now, where is all this going? And I think, of course, that's a big, uh, big uh, question mark. Um, the Sino-US relationship has created, uh, you know, a number of problems for joint venture universities, particularly those from the United States. Uh, first, there are uh, questions by students about what is the longevity of this joint venture? You know, is the joint venture going to last during the times of uh, uh, tension and uh, political stress in the bilateral relationship? And parents, of course, are asking the same kinds of questions, particularly Chinese parents, but also international parents have raised the same thing. We also get similar kinds of questions from faculty, uh, particularly younger faculty who are looking to start their career and are making a choice, say, between a job in the US uh, or a job uh, at DKU in China. And they wanna know, again, what's the sustainability of this uh, enterprise and will it be shut down either by the Chinese government or by the American government or maybe even both. And uh, we try to you know, you tell them that we have had no indication whatsoever that the, uh, uh, the venture is at uh, under any threat, uh, and I think that that is held true. But nonetheless, uh, they, they, they raise these questions and they are, they are fairly constant. The third uh, challenge has to do with financial stability. As I mentioned, these are not inexpensive enterprises. Uh, in order to recruit world-class faculty, you have to pay world-class salaries and benefits in order to attract them to come. Um, the operating costs of building the infrastructure uh, is not uh, insignificant as well. Uh, NYU is building a new campus. We are in the process of building our phase two campus and the amount of investment uh, is, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, we are grateful to the city of Quinshan for uh, working with us to invest in, in this infrastructure, but nonetheless, it is a substantial amount of money and it is something that uh, does get affected uh, if the relationship were to go further, further south. And then finally, and I think uh, mo most important, um, DKU is not just a bilateral joint venture university. I think that from the very beginning, when the first day I stepped onto the campus, my idea of building DKU was to build it into a global university. Um, and as a global university, and you know, we have some very unique features. We have students from over 40 different countries. Um, we have faculty from over 13 different countries. Um, and this is a very multicultural international environment, more so in fact, than almost any campus in the United States. And the ability to get the student body to mesh, to get the entire community to mesh together when you have different cultural, religious, historical backgrounds is not something that occurs automatically. It takes a great deal of orchestration and facilitation on the part of our Dean of Students, on, on the part of our academic leaders uh, in order to make these things happen. So um, every day I, I say is a, is a challenge at DKU, but it's a rewarding one. It is, uh, for me, it's the best experience I've had uh, in my 40 year career working in China. Um, but I also have to, have to say, we must keep uh, uh, vigilant about trying to sustain these kinds of programs. Uh, I would suggest that right now, there's no more important time to have joint venture universities than today, because they are the building blocks for the future. When we, when we bring Chinese students and their international counterparts together, 
our, my hope is that one day in the future, when they meet each other, whether it's in a business negotiation or a government negotiation, uh, they're able to work together in a more smoother, collaborative kind of modality uh, and not encounter the kind of tensions and adversarial relations that we've seen most recently in the relationship. And uh, therefore, you know, again, I'm very optimistic that as long as we can sustain these, we're going to have a win-win outcome uh, in the years to come. So let me stop here. And uh, again, I'll take any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Professor Simon. Uh, please don't turn off your camera. I will bring uh, Professor Shangye Chen. And in fact, uh, three professors from ECNU to join the roundtable discussion. Uh, I just, uh, well, Professor Simon, when you um, are giving your remarks, well, I keep thinking one word, one key word you mentioned, longevity. Uh, whether it's for individuals making decisions um, to invest in their international or education uh, in the future, or for um, a partnership like DKU, well, going into very much heavily invested financially, uh, human development and all of the uh, even political investment into that. Um, we, we are talking about, well, the sustainability of um, a program of someone's future and education is not a short-term investment. It really yes. is, uh, we, are, we are looking not just in the next couple of um, months or years, and it really is going into the future. And as you mentioned, well, when we are having difficult times and when we have people who have that fundamental shared understanding, uh, when we are sitting at the table to discuss, to negotiate, uh, it's a different direction that, well, it can be, um, and we can head towards. Yeah, thank you. So now we have uh, three professors joining the discussion. Um, Professor Li Mei, from Institute of Higher Education, uh, Wang Kao from Institute of Curriculum and Instruction, and Professor Zhu Gang from Institute of International and Comparative Education. I welcome uh, all of you joining this discussion and also um, uh, we will soon go into the Q&A for the audience. Um, uh, I would encourage uh, the audience well, to share your questions and the comments in the Q&A as well. Uh, so perhaps I will first will turn to the three professors who just joined in the roundtable. If you have any comments or uh, questions well, towards our two main speakers. Hello, uh, it's my great honor to join the roundtable discussion. Uh, 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 first, uh, I think um, that uh, I agree with uh, Professor Chen Shuangye that in long run that the U.S. Uh, educational exchange relationship is uh, optimistic. But, uh, and also, I think it's very important and the U.S. China education exchange is the most important international education relations. This is true, I think, for the past, for the present, and uh, for the future. So uh, I think uh, uh, also Dennis has mentioned about actually is a win-win uh, uh, situation and also mutual benefit for both U.S. and China. Uh, for, for example, I just uh, point out some um, numbers. Actually, U.S. hosts about 1 million international students, uh, among them one third are from China. And also, uh, US hosts a large number of international visiting scholars, and uh, also most of them are from China. Also, I think uh, US trained uh, a large number of international PhD science, uh, PhD students, and 80% uh, <coughs> of them states within the United States on graduation. So I think from this point, it's a mutual beneficial for both uh, US and China. Uh, and also, I think the last four decades actually witnessed the golden age of the US-China uh, educational exchange errors. 
Uh, and the second point, I would like to point out that uh, about the changing things in the future, uh, according to my own observation and also some, some studies and surveys, uh, I think uh, I found that there have several challenges and changing things uh, ahead. First one, I think is the number of Chinese students will choose uh, US as the major destination for study abroad will decline. And also the willingness of parents and the students to study in the United States will also decline. I think the major reason we, we have mentioned about is both the pandemic and also the policy both, uh, I think mainly in on both sides of the policy now is in short term, I think the number will decline. And also, I think the US uh, position in the global international student market uh, also will change. Uh, we all know that actually uh, US is the number one hosting country of international student, but uh, you can see in the near future, I think this position, US dominate the global international market will, of course, I think we are uh, we are declined. Uh, on, the other, on, on the other hand, uh, I think that some other inched countries and also the uh, advanced country like uh, in, uh, like UK, like Canada, and also uh, Australia, and uh, uh, and also other European countries and Japan, we are hosting more uh, international students. Uh, and also, I think uh, the determining factor to, 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 to impact the student choose the destination for study board also change. Uh, in the past, I think the educational factor is the number one, but now in this period, I think some other factors like safety and also cultural and policy factor will impact the student choice of the destination. So I think uh, also, some other autonomy, uh, other uh, uh, online education and uh, internationalization at home and uh, sign up for joint venture university will become an uh, alternative approach for the students to, to, be in, to, to get the uh, internationalized higher education. Uh, and also, I think the change, uh, the, the impact of the pandemic also change a lot. According to a survey of QS, actually, they asked, they conducted a survey about the prospective international students. Uh, the uh, the this, uh, answer from time students, that I think 60% of the students said that pandemic uh, impact the, the choice to study abroad. And also, I think one half, 50% of students will delay the study abroad for one year. So quite a large number of students will be concerned about the choice of study abroad and the decision about the study abroad. That's briefly my observation and some of the survey results. Uh, I would like to uh, get some questions and discussion. Um, may I? Uh, thanks, Professor Li Mei. Uh, just based on your uh, remarks, can I just um, perhaps will follow up? You mentioned uh, the number of students will come into the United States and also the willingness of parents to send students uh, to US while we are looking at uh, a decline. Uh, in addition to the pandemic that's ongoing right now, what are our other uh, factors uh, like policy or culture or safety concerns. Perhaps, well, this question is not just for you, perhaps for well, all the professors from UCNU and the Professor Simon as well. Uh, what are some of the major factors that well, you have observed or hear from students when, when they are making decisions uh, to seek international education over, overseas? Can you ask my question? Or ask yeah, please. Uh, Dennis, please. Me? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we, we uh, Joint Venture University is an interesting position 
because uh, a Chinese student, for example, has actually now three choices. They can stay at home and go to a Chinese university. And don't forget the quality of Chinese universities has steadily improved, particularly among the top 15 to 20 universities. Um, they now have uh, like ECNU, for example, have internationalized, improved their curriculum. So Chinese university as an option is not such a bad choice. I mean, it's a very good choice. Second, now they have joint venture, which is an intermediate choice. Uh, stay in China, but get an American style education or in the case of Nottingham, uh, Ningbo or uh, uh, Xi'an, Jiaotong, Liverpool, they can get a, a UK type education. And then they have a third choice, which is of course to go abroad. And within that going abroad, as was just indicated, they have now multiple uh, places they can go where they will be welcome. So I think it's a far more complex landscape for the Chinese family than it's ever been before. That's why you see this tremendous growth in the role of agents and other kinds of intermediaries trying to work with families uh, and the families paying sometimes huge amounts of money in order to get uh, counsel and advice about where their, where their uh, kids sh uh, should go, particularly in single uh, child families. Uh, this is a, this is a ma major decision. Um, what we're seeing, like for example, this, this year, we saw a big increase in the number of our graduate student uh, uh, enrollees uh, from about 125 to uh, 207. And the reason why that number grew was that many decided they weren't going to even attempt to go to the United States in the fall. And they decided to go for a one year or two year master's degree at, uh, at DKU and uh, Fortunately, they're happy with their decision. We, we saw really big growth in our uh, MMS program, Masters in Management Science. And so these are all good indications that uh, um, the joint venture option is becoming increasingly attractive. And I, I hate to say this, but when there's bad news coming out of the US, about safety or crime or something that may be good news for joint venture universities in in a very you know strange kind of way because they they really do provide an uh, an a viable option where parents can be feel good that their kids at home in China and yet at the same time they know they're going to get a high quality education and uh, frankly the fact that we all the joint ventures must give. Uh, you know, their degree, their home uh, campus degree means that the quality is confirmed. There is no question that these are second best degrees or some, uh, some other, not the real Duke degree or the real uh, NYU degrees. These are all real certified accredited degrees. So um, uh, there is good reason. And I think that that's why a number of universities will, will look to uh, invest in joint venture universities in the future if the government uh, further allows more of these to be um, uh, to be developed. But let me just make one last quick point. We, we've just gone through four years of a very tumultuous uh, presidency in the United States where policy uh, basically just went off kilter in many different directions that really had not been um, aligned with, with the past. Now, I, I believe that, okay, we're, of course, we're not going to be on a linear trajectory from pre-Trump uh, situation where the numbers of students are just going to continue and everything is going to be uh, happy and uh, uh, everyone's going to be satisfied. I think that we are now at a point after 40 years of doing this um, uh, that we need to think about a new framework uh, for what these exchanges and these uh, education cooperation is going to look like. I don't think we can simply just say, well, it's gonna go back to the way it was, or it's gonna slightly decline. I think that we need to rebuild the foundation for this because what happened this past uh, 24 months is that education itself, because of national security issues and some other issues became the target of the tensions in the relationship. Whereas prior, it had been one of the foundation elements. These days now, it too is under attack as being a source of problems and issues. I think that that is a cause for concern that we tells us we need to revitalize and rebuild some facets of that relationship so it can proceed for the next 40 years under this new framework that I'm suggesting. Thank you, Professor Simon. Yeah, from ECNU, is there any immediate comments or response? 
Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I just uh, would like to briefly comment on um, Professor Stanley's remarks. So, so recently I found that uh, like, uh, uh, in terms of uh, student mobility, uh, some students will consider some uh, local global universities uh, in Hong Kong or Macau or Singapore, uh, because I find uh, these are wonderful universities. They are quite uh, yeah, high performing universities provide a very generous like a scholarship package for some uh, very high performing students. So sometimes uh, students will consider like the financial, uh, political, and uh, some other uh, issues. So possibly they will uh, choose these alternative uh, options and because um, they can also receive a high quality of education from these uh, like a knowledge poor houses. And uh, I think uh, this is a very notable trend in recent years, possibly this year and next year. So that's my uh, comment on yeah, Professor Simon's remarks. Yeah. yeah. I, I would agree. I would agree that that is in fact uh, very important. Um, but you may know, you know, in Hong Kong, there are some limits on the percentage of Chinese mainland students that can uh, attend Hong Kong universities. Um, that's the reason, for example, that places like HKUST, for example, are building campuses in, in Guangzhou uh, so that they too can have joint venture universities to increase the number of uh, uh, students from the mainland uh, coming, uh, coming to their institutions. Um, Singapore, I think, you're, I think you're exactly right. It's a great place. Uh, lots of Mandarin pe speaking people in the environment and uh, you can find yourself in the middle of a, uh, uh, you know, a park or a restaurants and people are only speaking Mandarin. So a very comfortable place for, for Chinese students. But again, you have to remember that's an, a small island economy, you know, uh, with, uh, with a yeah. three million people, it can only take so many students from uh, from abroad. Um, the, the, real, the real question I think everyone's interested in is what's going to happen with Europe? Um, and will Europe become a more attractive place? Uh, and will the Europeans and the EU uh, begin to work to take in more Chinese students? I, and I think that's a real possibility that Europe may be the beneficiary in the short term of some of these uh, uh, tensions that have existed in the Sino-US relationship. I would like to also respond to this question uh, about the uh, student situation. I was uh, I was conducting a, a um, focus group with uh, several, uh, with I think about um, uh, fifty parents, students, and teachers uh, who are now in the international education are going to international schools in China, and um, from my um, interview with them, they are still pretty sure that they will go out, they will go abroad to study. And uh, because, of, because they are already on the track of international education because of what we call sank cost mm -hmm. for this whole international education. And um, it would be really hard for them right now to change the, to change the track and go to a different route. Um, but I would also say that um, uh, the international education also those who are accepting um, uh, international education is a very diverse population. So for those who are going to the United States, they're still going to the United States. But um, for those who haven't been entering the, the, the track yet, um, they will probably have different choices. As, as we just mentioned, they probably can go to Europe and can go to UK or go to different uh, uh, countries. But um, um, I would also say uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine or it's, it's, we will need to see the, the damage on the host country side is already done. Many universities, um, they are closing the programs. Mm -hmm. They are actually not uh, uh, considering uh, uh, reopening those programs. So uh, for those part, we need to reconsider and, and see what's the future for, for those programs? What's the future for those universities? Yeah, that's what I would say so far. You know, you know, one of the things that most people don't realize that um, as these numbers of international schools in China have grown, uh, they produce a very good quality graduate, particularly in terms of English language and also global awareness, but they cannot apply to attend JV universities. You must have a Gaokao score in order to be eligible 
to apply to DKU or NYU Shanghai. And if you don't have that, you basically are nef left with no other option but to go, but to go abroad. This is something that um, when I was the EVC, we raised with the ministry because uh, this is a good cohort uh, from which to draw upon. And even on an experimental basis, it does make sense, for example, to uh, uh, allow JV universities the opportunity to recruit from this group uh, in, in order to expand, uh, expand the, uh, uh, the pool. Um, I think this is something that could be very, very important and could be actually a game changer uh, as it uh, might yield, a, uh, again, a better, a better cohort, particularly in terms of uh, e English language preparation, which, uh, as you all know, it's one of the biggest challenges, whether they go abroad or they go to a JV university, finding qualified students whose English is good enough to write essays and uh, read uh, a couple hundred pages of uh, uh, text uh, a night. Uh, th this is something that is very challenging for the students. I have noticed that while um, while we are talking about well, students' mobility, there is um, a question about curriculum, whether we are talking about English language uh, studies or the other curriculum that whether at the national level while well, in China while well, addressing international competency or for students going abroad uh, or choosing the international school in China. So there are these questions regarding uh, what kind of curriculum that we are building and where the international competences or uh, to prepare students for the kind of international experience or exchange of views and understandings that we are aiming for. Um, so I would like to uh, direct the discussion uh, to that topic. I know Professor Chen, you mentioned uh, Professor Wang Tao has done some research regarding the national curriculum in China, especially on this topic related to international competencies. Uh, perhaps Professor Wang, you can start with that. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd like to address this question uh, in two aspects. The first is about the overarching part uh, as we're talking about the international competence, or we call it in another name, global competence. Um, first, in the, in the government level or in the national level, we are redesigning the whole educational system in the last five to 10 years. So uh, we are designing the competence-based curriculum. So uh, while we're designing the competence, we have a specific competence called international understanding. So that is one of the 18 competence that we design in the overarching level. And um, uh, to keep it aligned with the whole curriculum system, we try to design it in a subject level. So we got something called a subject-based competence, or we call it curricular competence. Uh, for example, in different subjects, in the language uh, uh, subject like uh, English, Germany, Spanish, we got a, a specific competence called cultural awareness. And um, so, and um, and also uh, for other uh, standalone subject like um, uh, political uh, studies or politics or history or uh, a geography. We're trying to develop, a, like for example, for the history, we're trying to develop students' uh, awareness of their national identity and also their cosmopolitan identity. So uh, uh, those are something that we're trying to develop in our traditional subjects, as we just mentioned, the politics, the history and geography. And, uh, and as I just mentioned, the most uh, uh, obvious or, or the most frequent subject that we are using is uh, languages. But uh, beyond those um, standalone subject or traditional subject, we also see that um, um, in many schools and especially those international schools, they are trying to design the school-based curriculum. Uh, I just did a survey uh, on those um, international schools and they're they're using all different kind of uh, a curriculum, let's say um, uh, uh, internet call international understanding, or it could be more localized of learning about the local uh, environment, how they could uh, keep it in a sustainable development way. And um, beyond that, there are also different kind of activities, let's say uh, having service learning and uh, also having those model uh, United Nations and also having those summer camps. So. Uh, just to, to just try to sum up uh, in, in a little bit of way, 
just first, I think uh, we're trying to redesign the whole curriculum uh, based on competence, based on global competence. And also for the curriculum we just mentioned, we design not just the national curriculum, the, those traditional curriculum, but also um, on the school level, they do have some autonomy to design their open curriculum. So that would be it. Can I just to follow up on what are some of the core competences that, well, as you mentioned, international competence um, mm -hmm. are some of the core values that, well, within these international competences that, well, can be can break down, and so that the stu uh, the students or schools will can follow. Yeah, that's a very good question about the global competence. Yes, uh, there are. Uh, from our national design, there are three aspects. The first aspect is about you have a global perspective. You're able to recognize different uh, uh, issues, local, national, and uh, global issues. The second aspect would be recognizing differences, would be able to resolve in the conflicts. And the third aspect would be uh, uh, something we call a shared humanity. We're able to uh, get together to deal with those common challenges. So those are what we designed um, in China for the global competence uh, in three aspects. You know, at, um, at the DKU in our curriculum, uh, we have this uh, concept called rooted globalism. And uh, all of our students are to be, um, you know, made familiar with this. And uh, it has to do with uh, uh, strengthening one's awareness of their own culture and history while at the same time enhancing their awareness of a global uh, multinational perspective. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I have to say, you know, again, just putting the students in a classroom with people from other countries doesn't necessarily make this happen automatically. It really has to be fostered. So one of the things that we did for our students is we organized what, what I called wow trips. And the wow trips is that we took them to a very unique place in China in a mixed group where they had to make friends with people from other cultures and other countries. And uh, sometimes they were very uncomfortable as their seatmate was from another part of the world. Um, but by, by doing that, we built some bridges among the students and that formed some friendships. And those friendships, in fact, proved to be very worthwhile during the COVID-19 uh, experience when students were separated around the world and they communicated with their partners or buddies uh, from China, Africa, India, wherever. Um, it was really one of the most uh, um, rewarding moments uh, uh, of, of this kind of experience. So I think... Uh, uh, our former chancellor, uh, Chancellor uh, Liu, uh, Liu Jingnan, um, was, uh, I think, one of the developers of this concept of rooted globalism. And uh, it's, it's become a very powerful part of the DKU curriculum as we uh, prepare to graduate our first class. Yes, I, I highly agree with those uh, trips because um, like my uh, program or my research was about multicultural education. And there was one thing that's uh, um, there's one activity that we would design to help students recognizing those uh, differences and dealing with those differences are having those kind of a, we so, what we so call uh, uh, the, those cultural trips for them to, to recognize, to, to have, more, uh, have more experiences with different cultures and um, learn how to deal with those cultures. Yes, can I follow up with this question? Oh, yes, I just want to uh, yeah, relate to this question to teacher education. Uh, you know that uh, at ECNU uh, each year, uh, I, I guess except for this year because of the coronavirus um, pandemic, uh, each year we will send about like a, a 50 to 100 uh, and the graduate level preserved teachers to University of uh, British Columbia. Um, we hope these preserved teachers can exchange the pedagogical ideas from uh, abroad, especially from the Western world. Uh, in this way, uh, they can um, broaden their um, pedagogy and uh, their uh, classroom management skills. I think this is quite uh, beneficial and uh, we need this uh, like uh, international exchange in teacher education. Yeah. So. That's, all. That's my comment. Well, indeed, well, teacher education is a big topic, uh, especially while well, given the challenges or we could say the opportunities, technology 
has presented us. Uh, a lot of teachers, uh, I know many of the audience uh, are teachers themselves as well, um, have had to swiftly switch to online teaching almost overnight. Um, but in the end, well, when we are talking about international education, teachers are at the core um, of transferring, not only in preparing of our students, but while bringing the understanding and knowledge back and forth. Uh, I want to be um, cautious, uh, careful about the time. Uh, it's a fascinating discussion. And um, our uh, colleagues from ECNU also, I want to point it out, have posted some of the links in the chat box uh, with the articles that you can find online. Um, we are uh, getting to the end of the program, um, but also I want to uh, thank all of the speakers, all of the audience to join this discussion. There are many big topics we touched upon today, uh, and we didn't have time to go over. As I mentioned, uh, I hope this is uh, the first of many discussions that we will have uh, between um, us and the colleagues from ECNU, from uh, Duke University, from colleagues from all over the world. I do want to, I know everybody here is optimistic um, and <laughs> from speakers and audience, uh, we are um, either personally or the field that we are working in uh, have something to do with international exchange. Uh, and in part, we are buying that already. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I would like to uh, um, close the program with the question on the silver lining. Even though we are having the difficult time, uh, given the political context to the pandemic that has uh, reinforced certain challenges, uh, what's your hope to see some of the goodness for US-China educational exchange in the future and why? Uh, I will start with Professor Chen. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, this is the um, this kind of a kind of a final remark on this kind of silver lining for the future. That is, uh, just as since I mentioned, uh, the speakers today are very optimistic. I think this is a kind of barometer. If for us, we are in the very front line of educational exchanges between U.S. and China. If we are optimistic. So I think that would be a kind of a bad sig a signal for the future. So when we are still optimistic, you should trust us. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. And then I will move to Professor Dennis Simon. Well, I think that uh, anything that's worth uh, doing is worth fighting for. And I think that uh, while the, uh, it may be tough going right now in the short term, um, I'm, I believe that those of us who are already converted and in the church of the converted, we ought to uh, uh, get some more disciples to come into that church and uh, uh, begin to, uh, you know, take a strong advocacy role. And in particular, the one thing that I'm looking forward to is the ways that we can increase the numbers of American students that are going to China. I think we, we haven't talked about that much tonight, but uh, I would say that that's the missing link in a lot of this. Um, many of the uh, uh, many students from the U.S. who have gone to China have had really great experiences. The problem is we simply don't have enough of them going. And uh, uh, maybe for your next program, that should be the target. You know, how do we get more Americans interested in studying in China, um, particularly now that we have uh, many excellent universities in China and there are great opportunities for them to find uh, study programs in English as well as in Chinese. And so I think that that uh, leads me to be more optimistic as well. One starting point, perhaps, is for American students to study Chinese language. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we are also many, many of us, including China Institute, we are in the field of teaching Chinese language in the United States. Um, as well, Professor Chen, uh, in your presentation at the very beginning, mentioning English still is the is the language that with the largest number of students in China. So that's right there, we have the hope because when you speak the language, you speak the heart of the culture. Um, we have uh, comments from audience. 
but uh, not that many questions so far. I will continue to move on to Professor Li Mei for your final remarks, please. Uh, I think uh, um, I'm, I, I mentioned about that. I'm uh, pessimistic in short term, but uh, very optimistic in long run. I think this is because all of us are, uh, I think, uh, not only as educator, but also as uh, important scholar, we are the, actually the free demand across the Pacific between US and China. We are also uh, make contribution and make action to change the uh, relationship between US and uh, China by our research and by our, I think, uh, uh, education. So uh, um, it's very bright future for us. Words, researches, and actions. Uh, yes. I, I also want to read a few comments from the audience, uh, from Mr. Michael Prayer. Uh, please continue to be optimistic and fighting for educational exchanges. The experience is transforming. Thank you, China Institute. Great panel, great discussion. And also from my colleague, Dinda Elliott. Um, wow, great discussion. And uh, we have uh, also a couple of um, audience also sharing uh, their positive feedback for to the discussion today. Uh, so, uh, Professor Zhu Gang, I know yeah. we are a little bit over the time, but well, we, we, we can uh, complete our discussion with two final remarks. Professor Zhu Gang, okay. please. Okay. Uh, I I think during this polarized globalization period, uh, global education exchange is critically important. Uh, we all know that the uh, United States has the advanced uh, educational system and uh, China had, uh, and the United States had so much to learn from China. And I think uh, apart from the joint venture universities, we can make many efforts in like a uh, student exchange, faculty exchange, and even public school uh, teacher exchange program. And finally, I believe we will have a win-win outcome. So we will move toward this direction. So that's my hope. So that's all, yeah. Thank you. And last but not least, Professor Wan Tao. Yep, um, I would say it's, hard. it's been a hard year. It's been a really um, tough year that um, uh, with the globalization that uh, the coronavirus tra travels really fast. But uh, we would have to see that uh, the globalization is also bringing the technology, is also bringing the tools and also ideas to solve this problem. So uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, let's just keep working together, uh, uh, not just scholars, but also our, you know, just human, just let's, because we are sharing the same humanity so that let's just work, work together to work for a uh, sheer future. Yeah. Okay. And with that, well, thank you all for our amazing speakers and uh, our audience who tuned in today. And we look forward to more discussions as well. We are the converted, but we still need to talk to each other, with each other and working together. Thank you all. Have a good night or enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.